So let's look at some examples for question six, dealing with the pacing of knowledge. Now we ended off uh, the pacing video with the discussion of how you work with four different options in terms of pacing. And it worked through a combination of working with either light or heavy topics or concepts on the one side and working slowly or quickly on the other. And these worked in combination. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to go through a number of possibilities uh, a number of examples of these four different options. And let's start off with a situation where we're going both light and slow. Now it's probably the lowest demand zone that we're working with. And I'd like to discuss a model uh, in South Africa, which is known as the chorus model, and use an example from one of the classrooms. Now this is a grade one lesson, and it's an excerpt which uh, is discussed below. And it began with the teacher listing the different consonants that begin with tsh. Now the teacher asked pupils to give words that began with each of the following words. Chi, che, cha, chu, chu, or cho. Now the first part of the lesson involved pupils correcting the teacher in chorus because the teacher had omitted to write a dot at the correct place for the consonant with I. Chi. The teacher took about 10 minutes in this part of the lesson. So you can hear that it's going very slowly and the demand is actually very low. Pupils listed the following words below with the teacher writing them on the board. Uh, the pupils gave the following ones. Chinakaho, uh, Chilitsi, Chililo, Chihifwa, Chinoni, Chivitso, Chimangadzo. And apologies uh, to people who know their vendor. But what's really interesting is when you take a look at what happens then with the discussion with the teacher trying to work with the learners in terms of how many sounds are being made when you say the words. So the teacher starts off, the teacher goes through a number of words and goes through this and finally she gets to this word. Chinoni. Now the teacher says this word at the same time that she's pointing at the word on the blackboard and several pupils raise their hands to be nominated. The teacher nominates a pupil by calling his name and then the nominated pupil kind of guesses or says how many sounds she thinks there are. And in this case the, the student, the learner says four. Now the teacher keeps quiet, doesn't correct, doesn't say anything in response to the pupil's answer. And you can see all of a sudden the other pupils start to realize, ah, oh, this might not be right. And they begin to raise their hands because they want the teacher's attention. They're competing to see if they can get the right answer. So the teacher goes one by one. She nominates several pupils with no one able to provide the correct answer. They're guessing this. They're guessing that. Some of the pupils guess that there are four sounds in the word and they repeat the same error committed by the first pupil. Uh, now, by this stage, it would be very frustrating probably to you because you don't know if you don't speak vendor what's actually right here. Is it chino ni or is it chi no ni? So there's actually a choice probably between two and three sounds. So now what happens is eventually the pupils split in the end between those who say they're two sounds and those who say they're three sounds. And then pupils begin to chant their answers, some saying two, whilst others say three. And eventually the teacher doesn't come down on the side that's right in terms of this. She instructs the pupils to decide which of the two answers was correct by casting their votes. And she says, let's raise our hands and vote. And the pupils raise their hands and the teacher counts the numbers of hands raised for each of the two answers. And then she says, those who say there are two sound patterns are in the majority, which means that there are two sounds. So it was the vote that decided whether there were two sounds or three sounds in terms of the word chi no ni or chi no ni. I find it a very interesting case, especially because this happened pretty much soon after the revolution in our country in South Africa, where we shifted into a democracy. And on the one side, you can start to hear democracy starting to play out and be enacted in the classroom. And that's very encouraging. There's something that's uh, quite beautiful about this instance, but there's also something which is tragic about it because the learners or the pupils are not being told what is right and wrong in terms of the knowledge structure that they're working with. 
So let's shift from that example to a situation where we're now going to work uh, with something that is still light. It's still pretty simple. It's still very basic. But this time the speed is going to increase dramatically. And in this instance, we're now working with direct instruction. And with direct instruction, remember what they try and do is they try and make sure that they make simple points uh, quickly where the learners move from point to point giving responses or giving indications that they actually understand what's going on. And you pretty much aim at about 10 uh, responses a minute uh, from the pupils to the teacher. So here you have the instance where they're going to make points on the coordinate system. And the uh, teacher explains that you have to write a letter next to each point. She explains that points are little dots, so you don't make a mistake about what they are. The points you will make will always be at the corners of the squares on the coordinate system. And the description tells what the X value and the Y value are for each point. So let's try it. Now what the kids have got is the kids have got a list in their workbook. And the workbook starts off by saying that uh, point A x equals 5, y it equals 7. Now the teacher says you follow these directions by starting at 0. You go some places along the x-axis. How many places? And she looks and the kids say 5. Then you go up some places for y. How many places? 7. Then you make a dot and write a small capital A above the dot. Do it. And all the kids go and they do it. They firstly go on the x-axis, then they go up on the y-axis. And then she says, make the point for A. Raise your hand when you're finished. She observes students and she gives feedback. She checks whether the students have got it right or wrong. And then you move on to point B. Now notice what's going to happen is there's going to be some repetition now. What does x equal? 8. What does y equal? The kids say 10. So go 8 places for x and 10 places for y, make the point and write the letter B above that point. Then raise your hand when you've finished. And so the teacher goes on with point C. And then when she's done point C, uh, notice that point C, x equals 0, y equals 2. You make the point, you write the letter, you raise your hand. There's the rhythm. It's going in rhythm. It's going quickly. Uh, the learners are working in time. And she does the same for point D, where x equals 3 and y equals 5. All the time you're starting from 0 and you're putting it in the, 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 the learner's point, put a D there. And then what happens is you get the check at the end. Check your work. Take your ruler and very carefully draw a line through the points you've made. Draw the line from one edge of the coordinate system to the other. If you do it the right way, all your points will be on the same line. If your points are not all lined up, you've made a mistake. And any point that is off the line is in the wrong place. And there you can see a situation where you're working quickly, uh, but you also are working simply with each and every single instruction, just one move that you make at a time. And once you get the rhythm of the move, you can actually do it. And the kids get through this quite quickly. It's quite a profound pedagogy, but notice in some ways the powerful difference and similarities to the chorus model. The chorus model was also working with this kind of chanting situation, but notice that there the chanting was often repetitive, and in that situation it wasn't clear what the correct answer was. Whereas here, it's crystal clear what's right and what's wrong, and the students are participating throughout. So now let's move on to a situation where we're going with something that's more heavy and more slow. And the instance I'd like to use comes from Singapore Maths, which is a program we'll find out more as the course moves on. But it's a very successful way of teaching maths, which has become popular in America, mainly because the Singaporeans beat the Americans in the various assorted international maths tests. Now take a look at what's going to happen here. It's going to be heavy and slow. So they're going to give the kids a problem which is going to take them some time to work through. They're going to have to think about it and then take various options and try various connections to see what's going on. And in this instance, they give the example where Joel has 219 marbles in three containers, A, B and C. If he moved 21 marbles from container A to container B, 
27 marbles from container B to container C and 18 marbles from container C to container A. There would be an equal number of marbles in each container. So, how many marbles were in each container in the beginning? Now, boy, you can start to crack on that. Well, the way that I would do it, I suppose, is I would start with 219 and divide it by 3, just to work out what the actual kind of um, the division number is. And I think that would be 73. So you'd know that each container at the end would have to have 73. And then I'd work with the swapping mechanism, which would try and work out how much got taken away from each container and how much got put into each container. Now, it's a multi-step problem. It requires the learners to use their critical thinking, their problem-solving skills to compete, to complete. And the child has to persevere, reason abstractively, um, abstractly, uh, and also, more importantly, use modeling and tools, but there's different routes, there's different sequences, different options that the child can take. And this makes the pacing far heavier in this instance, because the children are working with what the different possibilities are and trying to make the connections to get to the right answer. It's a wonderful instance of working uh, heavy, with a heavy object in a, a slow way. And this specific kind of uh, example, heavy and slow, is often a model which is said to work really well for working class students. You must spend extra time with them, give them time to work on the problem to make sense of it, so that uh, they can build up from uh, where they are higher and higher up in the subject structure. Now the final option is where you're moving heavy and fast. And this is a situation where you're kind of going from the novice who was moving in a slow and light way, now finally to the expert who's working in a very heavy and quick way. And the instance which I'd like to talk about in this example would be really working with chess masters. And what happens with chess masters is they have a situation where they're not only working with a whole bunch of, um, of moves where they understand not just the chess pieces, but the combinations of chess pieces held together in a kind of a complex set. They understand the patterns that are possible in the game itself. And those patterns hold with certain connections, which can go this way or go that way. And what happens is because they've familiarized themselves and learned what the possible chess moves are, they're able to work quite quickly with a whole number of patterns at the same time. Now this happened to me when uh, I met up with a chess uh, grandmaster and he was in a situation where he was playing 30 of us at the same time in a room and I was just one of the 30 with the grandmaster walking from table to table playing each of us and taking around about five, four, three seconds per table and then just moving around the table. So that gave me quite a lot of time to actually work out what my option was. But I certainly wasn't working the same way that he was. He was thinking at each time one move contained a whole bunch of possible moves and connections. For me, I was sitting with one piece and trying to work out if it went there what would happen and if it went there what would happen. And then by the time I'd worked out the third one, I'd forgotten where I was in the first place. And he beat me in about 20 moves. He was an expert. He was working with heavy combinations uh, and patterns quickly. I was a novice. I was working with simple chess pieces and making one or two simple moves with them.